Welcome to the second event in the TechFugees Toronto Talk Series. I'm Jules Phillips, and along with my TechFugees Toronto co-leads, Olivia Doggett, Munir Nasri, Amy Weinrib, and all our volunteers, thank you so much for making time in your day to be here with us. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We are audio and video recording this session. We will share it on YouTube on the TechFugees channel when this is finished. Uh, the audience is muted. You can choose if you'd like to appear on camera or not, no pressure. The way that we have it um, spotlighted is that only people who are speaking will be um, on the screen. If you'd like uh, to ask any questions during the Q&A later on, feel free to put them in the chat or send me a private message. Um, if you have any audio, video, or tech issues as we're going, uh, feel free to mention it in the chat, or you can email toronto at techpgs.com. I'll be monitoring that email address. After this, we'll send an email follow-up from the toronto at techpgs.com email. We'll link to the video. We'll send you a follow-up survey. We'll encourage you to join our mailing list. And we encourage connection. So feel free to tweet, live tweet, tag us. Um, all the social media handles for our panelists will be up on the screen in just a little bit. So a quick overview of how the next hour or so will go. Uh, sorry, 52 minutes. We will begin with a brief introduction, then Munir will launch into a moderated Q&A with our great panelists and we'll end things off with a Q&A. Here in Canada, it's customary to begin an event with a land acknowledgement. Although we're pro projecting virtually, we wish to acknowledge this land from which we are presenting today. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and volunteer on this land and to further the reconciliation process by sharing in this moment of reflection with you all. When we launched TechPG's Toronto last fall, we were excited to be the first TechPG's chapter in North America. As Canada's largest city with a booming tech sector and growing refugee community, we knew there would be incredible opportunities to co-create meaningful solutions at the intersection of these sectors. And now with COVID, we have the opportunity to extend that conversation across Canada really easily. So it's really exciting uh, to be able to have this conversation about Canada. As we all know, Canada is home to innovative refugee entrepreneurs. They create not only jobs for themselves and their families, they stimulate economies and enrich communities with their ventures across sectors food and hospitality, technology, robotics, employment, chocolate, and more. Today we'll hear from panelists throughout the refugee ecosystem, including a funder, angel investor, and successful refugee entrepreneur. And we'll find out what's needed to continue supporting these thriving refugee-led businesses across the country now and in the uncertain times ahead. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Tarek Hadhad was a Syrian refugee and now lives with his family entrepreneurial family in Canada. He joins us from Antigonish, Nova Scotia. He is the founder and CEO of Peace by Chocolate, the recipient of Startup Canada's National Newcomer Entrepreneur Award, named one of the top 25 immigrants in the Maritimes and selected by Google as the national hero case for 2018. And there's a fantastic video on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. A dynamic speaker, Tarek has shared his keynote with audiences across Canada, Jamaica and Europe having completed over 500 interviews with news leaders around the world, including just last week when Tarek celebrated his first Canada Day as a Canadian citizen. Tarek speaks about his family's journey, the positive impact of refugees, immigration, and the spirit of entrepreneurship. And he's also recently been selected as a finalist for the RBC Top 25 Canadian Immigrant Awards, which you can check out his competition on the canadianimmigrant.ca website. And make sure that you vote by the August 7th deadline. Um, next up, Kate Toman is the Manager of Business Development and Operations at Angel Investors Ontario. She graduated from Queen's University with a Master of Management in Innovation and Entrepreneurship. She holds a Bachelor of Science Honours from the University of Waterloo and a Bachelor of Commerce Honours from the University of Windsor. In 2019, Kate was the project manager for the Angel and Syrian Refugee Entrepreneurs Pilot Program, uh, which she'll speak more about, I'm sure, which involved two days of workshops followed by mentoring and a pitch competition to get them and their businesses investment ready. Otis Mishanga is the manager of programs and services at Access Community Capital Fund. 
a registered charitable organization that manages micro loans of up to $15,000 for small businesses and career development. He's an incredible community builder, previously worked at the volunteer uh, Toronto office as community engagement and volunteer coordinator. And from his volunteer history, uh, I can see that you're a big tennis fan. And our moderator today is Munir Nasri, who's just wrapping up the management of, uh, sorry, Master of Management and Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program at Queen's. He arrived in Toronto in 2016 under the private sponsorship program of refugees. And he worked with AXA, Newcomer Centre in Toronto, where he led the entrepreneurship, employment, skills building and mentorship programs for newcomers and refugees. And currently is working as a project officer with the Local Immigration Partnership, where he's focusing on coordinating cross-sectoral innovative collaborations to build and sustain welcoming communities um, inclusive for new Canadians. So welcome to you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jules. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Kate, Tarek, Oris, we are super, super excited to have you all with us for uh, this important conversation. Uh, to be honest, when uh, we were initially, uh, you know, planning this talk, we were in the middle of lockdown and peak crisis. Like we knew though that, that a lot of light has been shed on refugee entrepreneurship in Canada over the past few years. And we were somewhat concerned like, about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on established and potential refugee uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we've you know, all like, heard some incredible stories of successful refugee entrepreneurs who you know, defeated the odds and built businesses that proved that really anything is, is possible. So we thought, you know, we'd plan like a conversation to uh, see what's happening in the space when it comes to refugee entrepreneurship. Uh, we wanted to hear from a successful refugee entrepreneur and from someone that uh, supports newcomer refugee entrepreneurs and from a person that can bring in um, a system level perspective when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship. So just before we uh, get started, um, you know, we'd love to have a quick icebreaker so participants can know you all more outside of your professional affiliations and all the incredible work that you do. So, you know, we're going to take 60 seconds to ask you quick back-to-back -back questions and have you answer them in one word. So, are you ready? Awesome. 60 seconds. Let's go. Kate, um, I'll start with you. So, if you could instantly be an expert in a subject, what would it be? Um, so, I think my answer would be the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Tarek, if you could choose only one place to go on vacation for the rest of your life, where would it be? I would stay where I am, but I would be less busy. Okay. <laughs> I love Nova Scotia, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Otis, if you could trade lives with anyone, who would it be? Uh, that's a tough one, but I would say, <laughs> I would describe the person that would likely be someone who is making an impact uh, globally. Amazing. Uh, Kate, if you could eat one food all the rest of your life, what would it be? This is hard, but I think it would be pizza because it's weirdly versatile. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Tarek, uh, what's the last song you listened to? Uh, I'm actually very nostalgic. I always listen to Fairu. So the last song I was listening to, it's uh, It's okay. uh, Alone They Remain Like the Elder Flowers. I love that song. Beautiful. And uh, Otis, what superpower would you like to have? To eradicate poverty. Of that. Um, and my final question to everyone, I'll start with Kate. Uh, what is the first thing that crosses your mind when I say Canada? Honestly, the first thing is maple syrup. <laughs> Everything's food related. <laughs> All right. Um, freedom and uh, Tim Hortons double double. Amazing. <laughs> Otis? Um, diversity. Love that. Well, I mean, this was awesome, everyone. Thank you so much, um, you know, for, for that. Uh, you know, I know, like, our time is a bit limited today with a very packed agenda, so we want to make the best out of this, this conversation. So uh, we're going to get started and go. So maybe I'll start with Tarek. Uh, I'll start with you, like, 
you know, you arrived uh, to Canada less than five years ago. Uh, you know, you built an incredible business that have left a significant mark in Canada and really globally. Um, you also recently became Canadian citizen just before the pandemic. So right. tell us a bit, like, what's been happening, you know, in your world and, like, what's the business journey been like during COVID-19? Well, it's, it's certainly been, uh, been challenging. It's been uh, like a roller coaster of, of emotions, of ups and downs. You know, every day has not been the same like as we really planned to. I'm really glad that I started 2020 with some great uh, positive uh, mood boosters uh, like my citizenship ceremony. And just the day before, everything went on, shut, on shutdown. On March 15th, I had my sister's wedding. So fingers crossed, like, you know, things, things have been just great. Uh, we went into the shutdown with a great... Uh, boost of, of happiness and positivity as a family. But honestly, the, the way I believe about it is, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And during COVID-19, uh, as, as a business uh, in March and April and uh, part of May, we had to completely shut down to uh, protect our staff. Uh, as a company, we had almost 55 employees working in our uh, facility here in Antigonish. We had many people around the country working uh, with our company affiliated and even some of them were brand ambassadors, volunteering in marketing and distributions and many people who were really stakeholders within the organization and within our peace on earth society. So Peace by Chocolate is the business wing uh, and, and uh, the Peace on Earth Society is our social wing where we really uh, take um, whatever we do throughout the business and invest in partnerships like the one with Refugee Hub in Ottawa, with Phoenix Youth Programs here in Nova Scotia, where we work with homelessness uh, um, and we work to, to support youth in Nova Scotia, to work with indigenous peoples as well, uh, Mi'kmaq community, Pakinkik near Antigonish, where we have uh, done an, uh, a special thing for, for our partnership called NETA, means friend in Mi'kmaq. Uh, you know, many other organizations that we work with is uh, Canadian Mental Health Association throughout a special campaign as well. You know, so since the start of the pandemic, we just realized that nothing matters more than people. Like this is your number, one asset is your uh, collaborations is your friendships is your team and certainly i believe that our team is is our number one asset any any business that tell you their customers is their number one asset they're wrong i think you have to strengthen your relationship with your team in the first place to be a successful business overall so yeah since the beginning of the pandemic uh, uh, we have to re-strategize in the business we had big plans for expansion into outside markets like in the US and in Europe, um, around, around the globe for 2020. All of that had to be canceled. All of that had to be revisited. All of that had to be adjusted and adapted. And um, honestly, uh, I, um, I, I noticed since the beginning of the pandemic, people were so depressed and frustrated and they just felt this is the end of the world. So I, I, I shared my feelings about it in viewers. I said that in 2013, when the war started in Syria, the, the, it, tore, it tore apart my family. So many of my family members went missing, went killed, went arrested. And it was so harsh that we were forced to leave our homes. While in 2020, during the coronavirus time, we were asked to stay in our home and to stay safe. And I said, I will take the second, right? Like this is coronavirus for me compared to the war is a blessing. And we all know, you know, all the newcomers who came to Canada from war-torn countries, they know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, back to, to the business side, you know, we, uh, the only thing really that we, we, um, we were going to, to focus on was our commitment that we made in 2019 to hire 50 refugees by 2022 and to support 10 businesses started by refugees in marketing and distribution and also four businesses in, within our, our sales channels that we have built since 2016. So that's going to be as well uh, pushed forward. Hopefully the commitment will be pushed till 2023 or 2024 we are in communications uh, daily with many people across the country that we started working with since the end of 2019 as we started working on the commitment. But yeah, overall, um, you know, I think that it, it really doesn't matter um, how this is gonna, is gonna last. And we have just noticed uh, a new normal in the business. We have been working with uh, many amazing people. I haven't really got to fly anywhere else, so I stuck to my ground. 
and I built many uh, many relationships with local businesses and local people in Antigonish who supported our family to start the business in the in in the first place. So for those who really don't know, um, our company only started in 2016. Uh, we came to Canada as, as refugees, and without the support of our local community in Antigonish, nothing could have happened. We have got amazing uh, support from all the people around us that they were uh, very excited to rebuild our business and to rebuild our lives in this country like any other newcomer. And I truly believe that hopefully in the next, in the next while, we will be seeing Piece by Chocolate within the next few years by 2025, one of the top five chocolate companies in Canada. And I hope that this will be, we will be uh, on track for that. The last thing I wanted to mention during COVID-19, we noticed that chocolate always helps and yesterday we just celebrated the world chocolate day but in may we realized that we have to find a way to celebrate uh, healthcare workers and frontline workers mm -hmm. we created a partnership with goodable and we asked people to send us uh, videos of their kindness they are sharing kindness you know they are celebrating healthcare workers or supporting each other and uh, we we gifted uh, the winners a month supply of chocolate and there were really many winners in Canada and around that country. It's just a way to reward kindness. And I think that the world now needs more positive stories uh, more than ever because we are living in, in uh, such hard times, challenging ones, uh, but we realize that the human connection can be uh, certainly on the top of the significant priorities for all of us. Wow, Donna, like this was, to be honest, incredible and like the always admired, you know, uh, the strength, the perspective, you know, the, uh, the way really you present, you know, so much about like, you know, what Canada is all about. So um, thank you so much for, for bringing that. And you also mentioned something really important about like hiring and supporting other refugees. And that also brings me to, uh, you know, to my next question to Otis uh, on supporting uh, newcomers. Or just like I would also love to um, like hear from you a bit. Like, how is Access, you know, Community Capital Fund evolving, like to better serve and support uh, newcomers and refugee entrepreneurs moving forward? Yeah. So just to give a, an overview to those who may not be familiar with Access Community Capital Fund. So we are a registered charity here based in Toronto, but we cover the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. We are into micro, uh, we, we facilitate micro loans uh, to those who want to start a small business or, and we do have a foreign credential recognition loans program for newcomers uh, to facilitate their careers here in Canada by paying for courses and training and uh, all of the career related expenses. So we really help those who, um, uh, face some challenges or barriers to accessing traditional financing through the banks such as you know when you're new to Canada you don't have uh, your credit history which is a big thing here uh, which uh, can become a barrier for you to get uh, the financing you need uh, whether it's a loan from a bank to help you get started with your business so we do facilitate loans up to 5,000 to start so it's really micro finance based so for those who are initially looking to uh, for startup financing, um, or just have a plan, or no revenues, uh, but have a solid plan and can turn uh, anywhere else to get the financing. We facilitate that. Uh, for those who are looking to pursue their careers here, we uh, also have our loans program uh, for foreign credential recognition, up to 15000 to help them pay for career-related expenses. You know, you might be going through licensing, you might be taking a course, you might be taking an exam to facilitate your uh, career uh, here in Canada, depending on whatever it is, you might be a, a rec in the regulated professional uh, or non-regulated profession. So we all assist everyone that uh, meets uh, the criteria. So that's where we are. And uh, during COVID-19, we were uh, mainly focusing on how we can assist the clients we already have, you know, going through the challenges that uh, were presented by the pandemic in terms of uh, uh, loss of uh, income and reduced income. So making sure that uh, understanding that they do have uh, obligations such as their loans to pay. Uh, so uh, making sure that we came up with solutions to assist them uh, to make that a burden a little bit easier while they uh, you know, took care of uh, everything else and also uh, realizing that uh, many of their businesses were impacted as a direct result, but also uh, their training or their career uh, plans were, uh, you know, uh, postponed or pushed back because 
uh, uh, things uh, got shut down and uh, there was a realignment that needed to be to happen to reorient everything to online and in some cases that is not possible that is not uh, uh, it, it took a little bit longer so it means that uh, th there was a shift in in in, in trying to assist um, our clients to make sure that it, ma it, it made it a little bit easier for them to uh, manage uh, on both fronts you know so that they are not negatively impacted uh, financially uh, from that standpoint so looking forward uh, we we are always looking to evolve to provide uh, uh, more innovative ways to support uh, our clients uh, newcomers refugees uh, uh, alike uh, and because uh, uh, what we are doing is uh, a bit unique in terms of our approach uh, to how we uh, uh, assess eligibility, uh, assisting clients who may not otherwise be able to uh, get that uh, support from traditional uh, lending institutions because of the strict or the uh, strict guidelines that they go by. So we use the character-based lending model that, you know, really does not look at one specific aspect only but tries to uh, look at the um, take a holistic approach in terms of uh, the person's motivation and goals and uh, uh, the financial situation and mm -hmm. yeah timelines as well oh thank you so much otis really like um, you know Tarek mentioned something about like the role of community and like you know while they were starting you know their business and mm -hmm. point, like i know that you built you know, really community in Toronto to a lot of newcomer and refugee entrepreneurs that want to start that. So, you know, like your work locally is so important and I'm so grateful that we've had some opportunities to collaborate previously, um, you know, and like you know, seeing how your programs and initiatives can really transform their lives and support people. So thank you so much. Um, okay. Kate, this brings me to, uh, this brings to our second other question to you. Um, you know, you've built an awesome entrepreneurship program for Syrian refugees in 2019. You know, you work closely with investors and you're well aware of the entrepreneurship space in Toronto and Canada. Um, tell us a bit, like, you know, how was the journey of supporting and investing in entrepreneurship uh, you know, during COVID-19? Yeah, so first I'll give a little rundown about Angel Investors Ontario, like, very quickly. So we oversee the 13 angel groups in Ontario. So we have pretty even coverage across the province and about 1,500 angel investors. So these are high net worth individuals that... Um, choose to invest in early stage startups. So typically they're the first third party money in. So I think overall, really broadly across all of our groups, and I think probably the early stage investing ecosystem in general is that going virtual was really hard. It was quite a hurdle to overcome, <laughs> kind of ironically, since we deal with a lot of high tech companies. But um, there is still such a high touch point in this industry and in any you know, entrepreneur or investor will probably tell you the same thing. Um, that is really about these personal connections. Um, and so that was really quite hard and kind of jarring to a lot of our groups and to invest in a company without meeting them in person. I think at the beginning of this was very unheard of, but now it's sort of what is happening and they're, and a lot of our groups are moving towards you know, being able to support their portfolio companies and entrepreneurs virtually. And I think as investors and also angels provide, you know, lots of support and mentorship, access to customers and whatnot. It's not just mm -hmm. about the capital. They really support their portfolio companies. And um, so I think from that perspective, it was really important for everyone to sort of take a step back and a deep breathe and breathe deeply and just remember that entrepreneurship, building a business, is about the long-term view and certainly there's a need for additional support and capital and whatnot during this time um, but the economy will eventually rebound so taking that step back and having that long-term view for entrepreneurs and also for our angel investors i think was really important especially when trying to move things online and creating that you know those personal connections and that sense of community again for the groups online like i think our angel groups are communities and they play a role in their local community because often they invest regionally. So they do, you know, are very active in their communities as well. Um, so, and then for myself, 
at Angel Investors Ontario, we really shifted towards more of an advocacy role um, for these early stage companies. Of course, we've seen lots of stimulus come from the government, um, but there are still lots of companies that did not meet that sort of threshold that a lot of those programs had set out. And so there are, you know, lots of companies that are still facing liquidity challenges um, that you know had to put research and development or hiring or whatnot on hold due to this pandemic so mm. you know I think part of my role or at least that has been the last couple of months was to really work with our government and other partners to you know advocate for this early stage ecosystem because there are lots of companies that they might be very small, they might be, you know, a handful of people, but these are the companies that are going to grow and support our economy in the future. And so it's really important that we, that we, you know, advocate for them and try to provide them the support that they need. And of course, our angel groups are an integral part of their local communities, providing that support to their portfolio companies and as well as other companies. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That's you know, incredible to think of like the amount of, you know, pivoting and shifting that, you know, um, like all organizations today need to, you know, work on or businesses. It's, uh, it's pretty massive, but I'm really, you know, I really can't wait to see what everyone, all of you really will be working on in the next recovery phase. Cause like, it seems like there are a lot of exciting stuff happening, you know, in, the, in your worlds, uh, which kind of, you know, brings us a bit, you know, the conversation a bit to the future, you know, like, Tariq, I'll let me start with you. Like when it comes to the future, what are some of your, you know, hopes and fears, uh, you know, for uh, small business and like entrepreneurship, particularly those involving refugees uh, for 2020? Uh, well, you know, this is uh, an, an exciting time for, for all businesses, for sure, uh, to, to navigate through. It's uh, certainly harder on, on refugee businesses, though, because uh, most of the businesses that I'm seeing are pretty fresh. They didn't build uh, strong bees in the past uh, few years, and they have a limited market share and limited market goals that they, they really planned for and worked hard to, to establish. But they, you know, the, the pandemic has just wiped wiped through it like like crazy. Before we talk about the businesses by refugees, though, we have to address the the refugee situation and even the businesses is very connected to. Uh, to the general political overview in the country at the first place. We, we have to, to mention about the populists, right? In, in any country, we, I know that we are talking about Canada. It's not as uh, a significant issue right now. It can be in the future because these people t usually turn anxiety into votes by pointing about globalization and immigrants, refugees, elites. Uh, and when you ask them about answers, they never give you answers. They, they just give you slogans. And the first solution to them is always to close up the economy and expel the foreigners, right? We, we, we have seen that we are lucky to be in Canada where we have strong foundation of accepting these businesses as part of the economy and to be part of the backbone in the, in the economy. So I, I think, you know, for me, I, I love this conversation because I'm speaking from an experience and I know that in any business there are peaks and there are valleys in, in any type of business, right? So the valleys always make you uh, appreciate the peaks and prepare you for future valleys. And I think for all the small businesses started by refugees or owned by refugees, I, I think that we should all keep strong relationships with our community because we want, all we want to, to, to have is, is, a, is a peaceful life and, and thrive with our business and with our families and with our community. And then the next phase will be to support those who are, who, who still didn't figure it out. Um, I, I think for any business person as well, there are some key tips that they should be uh, doing for, for the next while and the future is very uncertain and unstable certainly for so many businesses that they had to close. I know at least five businesses in Nova Scotia that they were started by refugees that they had to close uh, within the last uh, oh. few months and the number could be certainly much higher. I think for all of those business owners, you have to think about what are the results that you are committed to in the next 90 days in the next uh, uh, 180 days. Always focus on the future and build uh, a plan and a backup to that plan because as a human being, as an entrepreneur, 
progress is always the ultimate motivation and and results is is what we need to to be produced consistently whether we feel like it or not we have to simplify our focus and I, I always say to business owners that motivation doesn't hit you in the bed you have to take action within yourself and you have to readjust your plans right uh, just to adapt with uh, what's going on around you and i think covid19 has uh, certainly exposed some of our weaknesses and some of our strength within the business community but uh, as i mentioned i am uh, i was worried about the businesses owned by refugees now i am not i have seen a, a, a resilient uh, um, ownership by by amazing uh, newcomers and at the end of the day um, they are they are going to survive the next a few few months within the support of everyone in the country and we have a strong nation behind those businesses we are really lucky as well let me mention that if you compare the situation in Canada to other countries we are we are one of the one of the best performing countries during this pandemic right overall so ultimately the impact on refugee uh, and the businesses started by refugees uh, will be will be uh, significantly better than than any other countries. I know so many businesses in the first host countries around Syria, for example, the people there in refugee camps who start businesses are struggling to the most. Like they they certainly uh, were not prepared for this. No other country was prepared for this. I hope Canada can continue to focus on this group of businesses uh, to make sure that they survive for the next while. Oh, thank. You. Thank you so much for that, Tarek. Really, the uh, you know the level of like resilience and the strength that we've all seen, you know, and it's pretty remarkable. Like for refugees and for other, you know, people like while we're you know kind of coping with this whole you know, really difficult situation. And uh, you mentioned a lot about you know the support that is out there for people today, and we're definitely so fortunate to be in a place where. Uh, you know, that kind of support is available, whether, you know, from a community standpoint or like, you know, from a policy government also level. So, uh, yeah, which also like this kind of brings me a bit to, to, to my next question to Otis. Uh, like from your perspective, like, you know, what's needed for your like, organization and the people you serve moving forward? And like, what are some of your hopes? Yeah, so some of our hopes and, um, you know, just for us is to be able to provide the best possible uh, service to our client base and to uh, make sure that everybody in our community uh, is, uh, give, you know, has access to, um, uh, is financial, financially included uh, in, and which is a big part of what we do is to work uh, towards financial inclusion by making sure that we give access to those who otherwise may not have an opportunity. And we realize even from this, uh, uh, from just uh, what the clients we serve, uh, a big part of those are newcomers and they're entrepreneurial. They've got uh, the zeal and the uh, knowledge that they bring with them to uh, and they want they are ready to go to start uh, new businesses here or to really transition from the ones that they already had in, in their home countries and uh, do that here but you know oftentimes there are barriers and challenges because you're coming to a new environment and you have to learn about uh, new regulations a new process of what uh, it takes to succeed in business here so we do provide support services along with that so we're not just providing access to uh, the financing we are also helping them develop the skills and the knowledge they need so through one-to-one uh, -one business coaching that we provide uh, for anyone who wants to access our services that's something we offer we do have a women's business accelerator program uh, which is uh, funded by rcc which is for newcomer women who want to uh, learn how to start a new business here and get the foundation that the skills it's a six to eight week uh, program, which uh, is starting our summer cohort is starting uh, on July 20th. So if you know anyone or if there are other people uh, on this webinar who may, uh, who may be interested in that, it's going to be virtual. Uh, so anyone can attend and uh, really to, to give that, um, that foundation, uh, which is the basis for success. Uh, as we know, uh, most, uh, small businesses tend to fail within the first two years or so. Uh, and uh, that's not a, for lack of trying and motivation. It's because there's maybe something missing there 
and especially the knowledge gap is very important to uh, tie in uh, those ends and so that's why at access we always try to make sure that we are providing uh, the holistic supports around starting a business so it's not just saying okay he, you've come to us you've got uh, an idea to start a, a catering business or uh, you know this type of business uh, or you want to pursue this career years alone go and do what you know we want to set everyone uh, everyone to uh, for success and uh, when they succeed Canada succeeds we all succeed in our community so I think it has far-reaching uh, implications than just the individual and their immediate households. Uh, that's why uh, we are attracting talent to Canada because we realize that they've got more to offer, they've more to contribute uh, to the nation as a whole uh, in terms of filling the skills gap and the knowledge gap. Uh, so that's why it's important for us to uh, support uh, them uh, through not just access to the funds, which is one part of it, but also building the supports around it uh, through the coaching, through the uh, training programs that we are offering. So thank you so much. I would just like, you know, your, uh, you know, like programs and the support you provide, you know, again, like it's pretty you know, remarkable to people and like the, the way you built community in, you know, in the city for uh, entrepreneurs is pretty incredible. You also touched a bit on, you know, uh, women entrepreneurs and, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, news recently on the impact of COVID-19 on women entrepreneurs and how that's creating additional barriers on their businesses, on, on, on life as well. So it's pretty amazing that you have a support in place, uh, you know, so for uh, women that are, you know, in, in that process of starting a business. Um, yeah, Kate, this is my next question to you. Uh, like, you know, through your work at Angel Investors Ontario and your involvement in the entrepreneurship space, um, like, where do you think the biggest opportunity for refugee entrepreneurs will be in like a post COVID-19 uh, world? Yeah, so I think firstly, I think it, I, I can't not acknowledge the larger conversation about race we're having right now in this country, um, you know, mm -hmm. concerning Black Lives Matter. I think that opens up a much larger conversation about race and how people of color, indigenous, black people are treated in this country and certainly are left out of that larger sort of entrepreneurship conversation. Um, and of course are left out of sort of that, those traditional funding models as well. Um, and so I think that's opened up a great opportunity for Canadians, especially, you know, as like a white Canadian, obviously, um, to, you know, really face these biases and have hard conversations. And I think that's, a really interesting opportunity and I hope you know to continue to see organizations step up and put funding behind you know these underrepresented groups so I think that's a really great opportunity you know for us to keep having those conversations and I think specifically for you know refugees and you know perhaps newcomers in general that you know I think entrepreneurship is really going to have a large role in our economic recovery and of course refugees come here and they have such resilience and you know they are able to really you know grow from that adversity and those are great you know skills to have as an entrepreneur um, so to really use those to your advantage and use that as an opportunity to you know, I hope that we will become encourage refugees to provide services that, or build businesses that not only generate income for themselves and create job opportunities for other Canadians, but, you know, to also directly serve their communities. I think one thing that I've really learned and tried to remember when I have these conversations is that we need to go back to when we're talking about opportunities or programs or whatever for these communities we need to go back to the leaders of those communities and talk with them um, and I think too one thing that is interesting in this situation I know I just talked about how hard it was to go online for our groups and a lot of our angel investors but it's opened up a really interesting opportunity to you know, make those connections that you otherwise maybe wouldn't connect. You know, talk with someone across the country. Um, I think people are really open to having those conversations. Um, so, you know, reach out to your network and your community and, you know, try to 
you know, just have those like quick coffee chats. I think this is a really interesting opportunity that every, you know, everybody's sort of at home has a little more free time. I think people are much more willing to create new connections now. And of course, not being in person makes it harder to make those new connections, but it's an interesting sort of opportunity to do that. And I think too, there's been a lot of interesting like webinars or programs or things that people have put online for free take advantage of those as well. Um, I hope to see some programs in the future or in, like the near future that are really going to support underrepresented founders across the board. Um, and certainly the DMZ just announced some great funding for black founders. And I hope that this sort of extends to a greater conversation um, for underrepresented founders across, you know, yeah. multiple communities. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. To be honest, like there is, a, you know, to your point, like you mentioned, like there is certainly an opportunity when it's like in that recovery phase, you know, for a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs in general, but also for like refugee entrepreneurs that are just starting, you know, just to get, it gets a matter of, you know, access and support and how can people really get, you know, what they need, you know, to just like turn their ideas to, you know, meaningful thriving businesses. Uh, and then like there's kind of a role there, you know, for, organization that are serving them to always like include you know leaders people that are involved in that kind of conversation uh which kind of brings me, brings us to our last question i know we have like a bit of time left before our q a you know i want to ask like this question open like to really to all three of you uh how do you see like you know the role of government nonprofits, and the private sector when it comes to supporting refugee entrepreneurs in this current situation and in, in the next phase Yeah, well, I will jump in here. I think uh, one of the things that really, uh, let me just put it out there. One of the things that makes me um, fearful about the situation for businesses owned by refugees, operated by them, or in, in, involved by, by with the refugees, uh, on two levels, on the government level, is that the go most governments around the world, and, and sometimes here in Canada, we see that the governments are, are reactive rather than strategic. Right, and especially to the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen that you know things are, are changing every day. Certainly, there has been no planning. No other country has certainly planned for for this. And on the private sector side, I think that I would have hoped that I would see more private sector uh, organizations or businesses uh, that they are stepping up to help. Uh, refugees more in these uh, critical times. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen the leadership that we really were hoping to see from, from the private sector. On the non-for-profit sector, God bless them. You know, everyone is doing their best that they can, honestly, to, to support refugees uh, throughout this time. I was, I was in touch with many organizations in the past a uh, few weeks, and uh, they are they are uh, maximize they maximize their capacity to support um, businesses that they are owned by refugees. I think on uh, on all levels, you know, businesses owned by refugees, they need immediate financial assistance to bridge between now and until the recovery phase, and they need even even they need the resources. Uh, within the you know uh, marketing and distribution and any other any other uh, grants and, and loans, so we have seen the free interest loans for for all kind of businesses, but we certainly need to see more more grants that that these small businesses can access so they can still be alive because at the end of the day they are the backbone as I mentioned of the community as a whole. That's incredible points, you know, so important and you know, making also think of like. Um, you know, like even like existing programs and how to like, you know, we can just bridge more access to refugees and newcomers. Uh, Otis and Kate, is there anything like as closing notes you would like to add on that? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Kate. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, I think uh, basically it's, uh, it comes down to making sure that all, uh, everyone has access uh, to, uh, the resources uh, financially. Uh, I think that's a, a big gap that where we've seen where we're trying to uh, make sure that uh, everyone in the community is uh, uh, is assisted, is helped, uh, and um, I think a lot of the programs that were rolling out uh, excluded a, 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 a majority of uh, say people who would fit into our client base who, who may not really uh, meet the uh, 
qualification criteria for most of those programs. So that's from the, say, the business loan standpoint. So I think there is a greater need to uh, ensure that those gaps are closed uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, whether through uh, government support, whether through private sector initiatives and so on, uh, there is uh, that uh, need to look into those uh, uh, gaps uh, and try to fill them, uh, uh, which alone the, the nonprofit sector cannot do. Uh, I think there needs to be uh, all hands on deck and uh, collaborative effort uh, from all uh, different sectors. Thank you. Kate, is there anything you would also like to add to that? Yeah, I'll just sort of play off of Otis a little bit. I think filling those gaps is really important. But one thing that I think government and perhaps the public and private sector can all sort of be better at is collecting data during this time. I think we've often like neglected a lot of these underrepresented communities and collecting data about the effects of um, this pandemic on them. So earlier in this whole crisis, I had the opportunity to work on a survey uh, between the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce and the Dream Legacy Foundation, and we surveyed around 400 underrepresented founders across all communities, women, people of color, refugees, immigrants, LGBTQ, and their effects on um, and what they have been experiencing due to this crisis. And I think the data that came out of that is really important, but there's still a need to Know, collect broader data to help fill those gaps and you know determine what programs are needed and I think that again goes back to going back to those community leaders like we at Angel Investors Ontario you know we worked with Jumpstart Refugee Talent for our program last year and Mustafa and the team there has been such a wonderful wonderful support and it's been wonderful to learn from them as well and I think just in general from our sort of angel investor side um, since it is personal capital, um, you know, I think during a recession or an economic crisis, angels and other, you know, independent early stage deal makers are really more likely to sit on the sidelines as opposed to large institutional investors. And I think our government, Canada, we really need to encourage continued investment and also this mentorship that angel investors provided to these early stage companies and need to encourage investment into you know, diverse founders and to, this is such a important, an important part, or it's such an important stage for companies to have that injection of capital. And this is really before they can attract, you know, attention from large institutional investors like venture capital or private equity. And there's this segment of the economy, this very early stage that are struggling. And of course, this includes refugee entrepreneurs as well. Um, so I think it's, you know, a role for, you know, government and perhaps the private sector as well to encourage entrepreneurship and to encourage continued investment into these, um, mm. these companies. Thank you so much, everyone, for, you know, all your uh, insights, for, you know, this engaging incredible important conversation uh you know i've just you know this brings us to you know the end unfortunately like the hour just flies uh you know it brings us to the end of this conversation uh now i will just want to thank you again you know for all your time support um and ideas uh i will turn it now to jules to lead us through the q a um uh, jules thanks so much munir and everyone we, um, Kate, you mentioned the um, new program uh, fellowship at Ryerson, and Sen's actually here. And I'm just wondering, Sen, if you can speak a little bit about um, Ryerson, the DMZ, the new fellowship, and maybe you can, not to put you on the spot, but uh, to kick off our Q&A with a question at the end of that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, first of all, thank you, Munir and Jules, for organizing the event. And inviting me to share a few words about the DMZ. And again, thank you to the panelists for sharing kind of their perspective on the things that are doing in the ecosystem uh, to support the initiatives. Um, just so, just to give some context, the DMZ has been around for 10 years. We are part of the uh, Ryerson University. Uh, we have two distinct programs that we run. It's a, a tech incubator and tech accelerator program. We work with companies 
typically that are at um, a stage where they have a minimum viable product with a few customers or users to companies that have uh, scaled their team to 30 employees, 5 million in revenue, 5 million in funding. And so that's kind of our sweet spot. So the accelerator works with later stage companies and our incubator works with the earlier stage companies. Uh, what we're really proud of and what um, was brought up earlier in this conversation is our Black Innovation Fellowship Program. So we launched that in May 2019 uh, with a few uh, strong partners in the ecosystem to support um, uh, black entrepreneurship and specifically trying to get a goal of 10 black founders in our, in our, in the DMZ program. Just to give you context, we around have, we have around 60 founders, uh, at any given time in the year. Uh, now we're being, now we're kind of keeping, we're increasing the goal to like, let's see how do we three X this, um, in the next 12 months. And so we're excited. I mean, um, about the program, obviously we know what's happening around the world and it's really brought a lot of attention to the cause and the time is now. And we've had a lot of like really um, incredible, strong tech leaders and allies come to the table and say, we want to support the initiative that the DMZ has been doing. So uh, we have a, ra a goal of raising a million in fundraising uh, funds. We have Harley Finkelstein, the chief operating officer of Shopify, donate uh, him and his wife donate $500,000. And we were just getting an influx of people coming to the table from organizations to individuals that are contributing funds. This will allow us to increase the capacity in the work we do for black founders. So that's super exciting for us. And we have some exciting announcements to come. I just, and you will hear about it. So follow the DMZ. I think uh, it's super cool. And some of the key individuals that are going to be taking part of it. Um, in terms of like, generally, like I think about the theme we're, we're in right now, like I think as a newcomer, as a refugee in this country, that's like, an extremely hard transition when you leave everything behind to come here. And then on top of that, you want to starting a venture or uh, this entrepreneur journey. So the resilience is high um, coming into this. And so um, I think that as DMZ, we're part of the startup. We have a startup visa program. We work with international startups to bring them into Toronto. This is something that we're trying to actively work on. We have a few international startups that we're working with right now, and we're hoping to expand that. So those are conversations that I personally am looking to have with newcomers that are trying to start companies uh, within Toronto that if DMZ could support in some capacity. Um, I guess the question I have, I mean, uh, to the panelists and, or, or even to the group is like, you talked about a lot of the work that you're doing. It's actually pretty inspiring. To, and it was a lot, a lot for me to learn too, because I, I, I did not know a few things, but I'd be like, I'd love to know like on your end, like one entrepreneur that comes to mind that's doing some awesome stuff that is a newcomer to this country. And like, it'd be good to highlight uh, some stuff they're doing within your portfolio, I guess. Um, I, so I'll go. I think I'd like to highlight one of Jumpstart's um, woman entrepreneurship program. So that was something, um, it's her startup. So that was something that sort of directly came from our learnings from our refugee and angel program. Um, and they, you know, really the name is escaping me of the woman who won, but uh, they were granted $100,000 to scale their venture. And that was like, an amazing program um, for women refugees. Now my voice is going, but like there are really great programs like that out there. And I think I wrote down very early on that Tarek said support from local communities. And I think that's so important in these times. And certainly like that, her startup program pivoted to being online and supporting women founders. Um, I've met one of them so far who has created a, like a health, it's not a health food, but it's a, like a granola bar, I guess. Um, and we had her at one of our pitch nights and it's amazing to hear her journey. And um, I wish I could remember the woman who won, but it was something farm. <laughs> Um, but you can go look it up. It's her startup. The, you probably find it on the Jumpstart Refugee Talent, their social media. But that was such an amazing program. It is amazing to sort of follow along on their journeys. Um, so there are great stories out there, and we just need to do better at highlighting them. How about you, Tarek or Otis? Any businesses come to mind that you'd like to shout out? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, on in in uh, from our client side, uh, we have a few uh, uh, you know businesses that are doing uh, well. One is uh, uh, a security company owned by uh, a woman called Gishel. She you know started off working in security uh, and you know took a leap of faith and now is actually uh, owning a, a security company and employing people. So th those kinds of uh, uh, small beginnings that uh, we help nurture and to uh, help get off the ground uh, really do have an impact, like I was saying earlier, in terms of not just uh, for the immediate uh, uh, owner themselves, but also for the uh, other uh, community members that they end up uh, employing uh, and assisting uh, in, in creating more opportunities uh, for uh, employment and uh, income security. So that's uh, one. We do have uh, Oriana. She has a landscaping business uh, uh, and um, uh, originally from Colombia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, she has uh, started this um, landscaping business. Uh, she has a agronomist background uh, from her home country and uh, came here and uh, really pushed through uh, some of the challenges she initially faced to uh, get this going and were able to uh, be a part of that story in terms of helping her get started. So uh, those are a couple that I'll share now, but there are many more that uh, uh, we, we have and uh, I would encourage you to uh, go to our website. We do have a directory of our clients as well. So you can take a look at that. Some of the businesses that uh, we have uh, helped uh, start and uh, get off the ground. Thank you, Otis and Tarek. Yes, yeah, so there are really um, tens of, of amazing entrepreneurs who came here and uh, they have established many uh, great businesses, especially certainly in the last a few months, I will, I will mention, I'm not biased basically, but that business is owned by my uncle who just arrived in Canada in October 2019. So he started the business right away here. He had a, a, a giant uh, clothing manufacturing company back home in Syria. But when he came here to Antigonish within only a few months, he started again. Uh, here in Nova Scotia and uh, the first thing he really did was you know uh, all the tools the PPEs for for healthcare workers and uh, now he's doing uh, uh, one of really his, his special things he's doing was the Canada the Canada masks he said that he wants to protect Canadians like they protected him so it's it was really heartwarming and uh, you know there are so many amazing businesses out west as well in, in Alberta and in Vancouver, Aleppo Savon in Alberta are doing amazing work. They are hiring local people, you know, uh, they, they just arrived there within only the last few years. And in Vancouver, many amazing food businesses. So the list is, is really long, but uh, I would encourage everyone to look up online for all of the businesses uh, that they were started by on, uh, by refugees or, or immigrants, because I think everyone now needs, needs a, a shot of support, especially those businesses at uh, this critical time. So uh, I would encourage everyone to support them. Amazing, thank you, Tarek. And that uh, is actually a really great note to close on. We at Tech DGCO, since uh, World Refugee Day on June 20th, we've been profiling a different Canadian refugee entrepreneur every day. So we have a list of 17. <laughs> um, and I can tell already that just in this room, virtual room, there are so many more stories out there waiting to be told. And we have, uh, in the follow-up email, I'll send out a list for anyone who's got sort of lists, directories, resources like that, because we'd really like to put together an open database of all Canadian refugee entrepreneurs um, that we can help just bring in a bit of extra profile to. And I will take this opportunity to thank you, uh, thank all of our panelists, Tarek, Kate, Otis, our moderator, Munir, the TechBG's international team for all the, the support and shout outs on social media, Amy for everything tech, Gail who created our awesome promo graphics and she's been tweeting up a storm this whole talk, Olivia for keeping time and everything she does behind the scenes, our volunteers, Jan, Sue and Lucia for helping it out, out and to all of you for being here with us. We really appreciate your time and enthusiasm for our mission. And that reminds me that I'm supposed to share my screen. 
um, and invite you all to join us next time for our Tech Beauties Toronto Talks event, which will be on the topic of social in, um, innovation initiatives that are made in Canada. So we're really excited to be building this Tech PG's TO community here. We encourage all of you to stay in touch, join our newsletter, and keep the conversation going. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, Thank you, everyone. you, everyone. Thanks a lot.